Hey, good afternoon, everybody. This is Duffy Cooley coming at you from TGIK. Um, and welcome to TGIK episode number 86. Uh, in, this, in this episode, we're going to explore, I'm going to try and provide kind of a reference for just understanding Kubernetes as a system. And there is a lot to this, and you, and you can tell that by the notes, um, which I've already put a link into or link for in the uh, the chat. I'm trying something new this week, so you can actually get to the notes by just going to tgik.io slash notes, and you will find them there. So uh, let's go say hello to everybody. Hello, Maddie. Good afternoon. Good to see you. Um, and I will answer that question, how is Black Hat, here in a second. Um, I'm, it was as a as a TLDR, it was incredible. I had a wonderful time. It was such an, a great it was such a great experience. Um, but we're going to dig into it a little bit more. Um, oh, I didn't realize the live stream. I may have misscheduled that. You know, I was doing it early in the week and I kind of missed it. But I hope that you can see me. So so that's good. Um, but that's just the scheduling thing. You know, sorry about that. <laughs> um, who else do we have here? ABC one two three is logging in. Martin from the Netherlands. Amin from Strasbourg. Mr. Sloka, one of my one of my coworkers here. Another a fellow hepto a fellow heptian, hepto and whatever it is you know hepcat. Um, <clears throat> Hamid from Ireland. I love Ireland. Ireland is such a beautiful place. Joy from Richmond, and we have octets. It's Josh from Colorado logging in with his octets channel ID. That's kind of funny. <clears throat> All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Again, today we're going to try and um, kind of build a, uh, a kind of a frame of reference for how to understand Kubernetes as a system. So how was Black Hat? Black Hat was amazing. I uh, I have actually spent like the previous um, a couple of the weeks previous working with Ian Coldwater, who is an incredible security engineer in the space um, to put together a talk on kind of um, some of the th gotchas and things to know about within um, Kubernetes. And some of that stuff we're going to talk about in this episode. Um, some of the stuff uh, that we were demonstrating and talking about there at Black Hat were things like direct scheduling, showing how you can actually bypass the scheduler to schedule something onto a node directly, and how that could be considered a, secure, a security surface or a problem. Um, we're also going to talk about, uh, we also talked a little bit about containers and I'll probably dig into that a little bit here. I'm not sure if I was going to get into it too much, but uh, we have a number of different definitions of what a container is over time. Oh, am I, am I hanging? Can you see me? Hello? Can you see my stream still? Okay. All right, that was weird. I still can't see myself with my own stream, so we come down here. Okay, good. I'm I'm back with it. I think maybe there was an issue with when the scheduling changed it or something weird, but all right, we're good. Cool. Okay. So a container. Um, one of the things that I've actually finally been able to like express in a way that is easily or, you know, can be understood is that I'm actually just going to flip to a server here real quick. When we're looking at containers, I'm actually going to flip to the different view here. Can you bear with me for just a moment while I flip to screen and face? Oop, different scene. Hello, everybody. All right. So when we talk about containers, I think it's important to understand like just kind of like what a container is in a way that can be visualized or understood. So what I'm, I'm on a server here, and it has Docker installed, Docker PS, and I can see a number of containers running, right? And so there is my kindest node, and it's running, uh, you know, the, the script necessary to, to bring up my, my kind cluster. But let's just go ahead and run uh, Docker run minus D nginx, name equals nginx. Now what I'm doing here is I'm actually pulling down 
effectively a tarball. Sorry. I'm pulling down a tarball that makes up the file system that that container is going to use. And then when I do Docker run, I'm actually going to start a process that will run Nginx for me locally. And, and in that process, this is actually where, in my opinion, the container really starts, right? So if I do pgrep minus a grep Nginx, no, or just Nginx, because that was silly, I can see my Nginx process running here, and it's running inside of a container. And so it has a PID ID of 777, and 907 is a worker process running in the side of the same container. Now, if you're trying to look for a way to understand just what a container is to the Linux kernel, one of the great ways to do that is to look at this directory, 777ns. And this output, sudo ls-al, proc, and then the PID ID, and then the ns directory, describes a mapping of that process as it relates to a number of isolated namespaced things inside of the Linux kernel. If I were to look at, um, <clears throat> you know, my own process, I would be able to see that the output for the two is different. There are some things that are in common, but many of these things are different, right? So in my case, like we're all we're in a bunch of different namespaces for this process, and the pro and the namespaces associated with the upper unit are also different. Now there are some things that are in common, like we're still in the same C group, but we're in but we're in different, um, and that's mainly because like of the way the way the C groups are actually going to enforce. There needs to be like a root C group that we're all associated with, and then down into IPC, mount, net, PID, and uh, user in UTS, you can see that each of those things is likely different for each of us. Right? And that's because the process that I'm SSH'd into is a different process with access to different namespaces, um, basically the default namespaces for the Linux kernel that I've logged into. Whereas the Nginx instance is actually mapped to a different set of namespaces isolated for that process when the Docker container was created. So when I do Docker run, there are a bunch of calls that are happening that basically present new, new namespaces and then position that process inside of that new namespace and only and only provide access to that to that um, that process to that specific namespace. So my PID namespace should be different and it is. My network namespace should be different and it is, right? And that's and that's how I see different things when I'm inside of the container and when I'm outside the container. That's the isolation model. So if you're ever looking for like a way to visualize a container as it relates to a process, this is one way to go about that. So, cool. Um, just wanted to share that with you real quick, and then we'll get back into kind of like our normal, our, our normal swing of things. So, so that was one of the things I shared at Black Hat, and, and we talked about some tooling like NSCenter, and we'll probably dig into that a little bit more. But I just wanted to kind of give you some frame of reference about you know, some of the stuff that I was talking about. So I thought it was pretty neat stuff. Um, but I received a lot of great feedback, and I know that they're going to post the video. And as soon as they do, I hope to share that video with you all as well. All right. So let's talk about the week in review, and then we'll dig into some of these other things. So week in review. Mr. John Harris, one of my coworkers on the uh, Cloud Native Architecture team, uh, put up an article on using sudo-like access with kubectl. And I've seen this actually implemented a couple of different times. And, and actually, I think he put a note uh, talking about that. Yeah, there's a, there's actually a project that kind of that tries to do this for you called kubectl sudo. But the idea of this is actually pretty cool. And I think from a security perspective, it's actually really important um, because it enables sort of a sudo level access. So to explain it, I'm actually going to go to the project page for kubectl sudo because I think they're going to do a pretty decent job of explaining why that's an important thing. Um, <clears throat> what's happening here is that we are we're making the uh, we're making the statement that every user can access Kubernetes uh, can access the Kubernetes cluster leveraging RBAC and authentication. 
Um, but that's at the but that the initial access for that user should be constrained only to those namespaces and resources that they can view, not necessarily to those things that they can write or change or modify, right? And so if you follow this pattern, what you're going to do is you're going to allow the user a credential, and that credential for that user will be bound to like a read-only mode or a view mode. And then any time that that user wants to actually modify or change an object, they can use a sudo-like mechanism where they switch to a different group using kubectl to, uh, to apply that change. Now this lets us give a little bit more um, uh, restricted access and also kind of cuts down on some of the mistakes, right? Like this is sort of the power of sudo is that you have the ability to make changes within your particular environment, but when you're going to make changes that would affect it in kind of a larger group, like making changes to something that's actually configured, you know, at the slash Etsy directory or, um, or, or something else like, you know, installing packages or those sorts of things, that you have to do that at kind of a cluster level or maybe even a system level um, sort of thing or uh, access. And, um, and I think this is actually a really great pattern for that. Uh, what this allows us to do is basically use a kubectl plugin, right? <clears throat> and it can be configured to match effectively the same argument that John is making in his article, that when a user wants to do something that is above their normal read or view only access, they would effectively impersonate, which is a capability of Kubernetes, one of the groups that has that ability to, to make that change. And then in the audit log, we'll be able to say we'll be able to say we'll be we will be able to see who did the thing at what time and and what permissions they used to make that thing. And you can imagine that this would actually greatly reduce the surface that we'd have to actually audit, right? Like we can look at for events that were only modified by these specific groups, which gives us a much better and kind of easier to read trail of evidence for what has happened that changed the overall state of the cluster rather than what happened in a specific environment. So I think that that's actually a pretty good, a good way to see it. Good afternoon, Joe. Good to see you. All right. <clears throat> so, I mean, this article and the associated project both get into this pretty well. I definitely recommend reading it. Um, it's a really great solution for, for how to provide kind of better isolation between the way that a user authenticates and, man and manages resources within the cluster and um, and how to and how to like understand that uh, a history of those events and how those things have changed over time. So, pretty cool stuff. Next up on this week in Kubernetes, we have a CVE. It's reserved. Hmm. Uh, I should have actually previewed this one. The entry creation. So yeah, like usually there's obviously a bit more to this. I believe what this CVE is referring to whoop, is Yeah, okay. So this is actually an interesting one. And if you read through what's actually happening here, um, effectively what's happening is that if you were to provide uh, in RBAC a role that gives the user of a, of a particular role access to something that's defined at the cluster scope, that that user can um, affect that thing at the cluster scope, even if they don't have access at a, you know, at, at, a, at a cluster scope. So that's a little harder to understand. So let me break it down a little bit. I create a user, and we'll call him Bob. And I associate with that user a role binding inside of the actual network, inside of the Kubernetes namespace that I want Bob to use. So we have Bob and Bob's namespace, and I create a role binding associating Bob with that namespace. Now, when I create that role binding, I might be able to use the cluster role that is defined at the cluster scope called cluster admin. If I do that, what I'm doing is I'm providing access for Bob to manipulate those resources that are not namespace scoped. Now, what this bug, what this CVE highlights 
is that Bob can actually manipulate those cluster scoped resources with this permission. Probably not what we want, right? Because he's supposed to be isolated only to those resources that are defined within his namespace. But with this permission, with this bug, what this bug has found is that because we've actually defined a way for Bob to access those things at a cluster scope, uh, he, can, he can actually modify and interact with those objects even at that cluster level, which is definitely more permissions than we expected to give. The, remedia the, re the remediation steps are obviously to limit Bob to only those things that are specific, right? So if you're using the admin role instead of the cluster admin role, you're okay. If you're not providing star dot star access into the namespace to Bob, right? Allowing him to act, allowing him to access any resource that is defined, you're okay, right? But <clears throat> but that is effectively the result of this of what this CVU is about, um, and what we've done to fix it is basically um, you know validate that the scope that you're operating from. Does, either does or does not have access to the cluster role, right? And so if you're scoped to the namespace, you're, if your access is scoped to a namespace, if you're coming from a role binding, then, we'll, then, we'll, then we will drop the permissions to access things that are outside of or defined outside of the namespace scoped scenario. And I know that was a lot to talk about. It was probably a little confusing, but that's effectively what the CBE does. The TLDR here is if you're careful about what permissions you're already giving to users, if you're using like the admin role, when you create a role binding, associating a user with a namespace, you're gonna be okay. But if you're providing wide ranging permissions, verb any, resource any, to something that's bound in the namespace, then you're giving more permissions than you think you are until we actually, until you're on a version of Kubernetes that, that has the fix. All right. I hope that TLDR makes sense. Give me some feedback in the chat if you if you think that was at all helpful. I realize that all of this is confusing to a lot of people. I'm going to go ahead and change this URL. So I don't have to forget to do that later. Let's see here. Bear with me for just a moment while that paste is in here. All right. Okie dokie. So the next one up, we talked about that CVE. It's an important one. Um, and I hope, that I, I hope that my explanation makes sense to folks about what's actually happening there. It is, a, it is a really important one. The next one, and again, in security, I talked a lot about this one this week at Black Hat. Um, this is really, really awesome in so many ways. Um, so Kubernetes is getting more and more serious about security. And there are a couple of different um, um, things happening inside of the community to, to kind of highlight that. The first is that we've done a third party security audit for, um, for all of the code inside of the, uh, for all of the core code inside of Kubernetes, right? And you can see the result, the direct results of that audit by navigating to um, that blog post that we're looking at. Um, but I also made kind of a short link just to make it so that I could find it easier. If you go to git.io kh audit, that will take you to the Git repository where the findings are. And you can go through and see and look through what you see here. And then also Atritus, the company that did the, the actual review, also put up an incredible article on how they um, went about doing the work. I'm seeing if I can find that article real quick because I thought it was also another really good one. Oh, I don't want that. There we go. Yeah, so this is actually on the Atreides, on the Trail of Bits blog. Mm -hmm. 
reason I can't find it again now. Well, I will find it. And I will link. There we go. Maybe that's the one? No. But they did a whole blog post on how to on how they went about the process of uh, doing this work, which was incredible. And I'll have to find that link and share it with you another time. But I thought it was really great how they kind of like highlighted what they were doing. I cannot find it. All right. Well, I will find it somewhere and I'll put it up. But yeah, like it was, it was pretty great. It was actually, maybe it was in the tweet. Uh, we have been working. Let's see if that's here. I'm going to stop looking here in a second, but I was really hoping. There we go. That's what I'm looking for. Okay, so this is what I was looking for. This is actually really great because it highlights exactly how uh, Trail of Bits went about doing this security audit and how, and what they found and kind of the way and, and the notes and stuff that they found also, which I thought was also just incredible, um, incredible information for just like understanding this space and how it works. I'm going to put that link in our HackMD so I don't forget to do that real quick. That's good enough for now. All right. So really cool um, that both we have a blog post from uh, the CNCF highlight, I mean, opening the source or the findings of everything that has been found, which is incredible, right? So like all of the report is entirely open sourced. And, and some of these things have not been fixed yet, but we're highlighting what has been found to be really transparent about exactly what the third party code review found, right? And then we'll work through fixing them. And then um, we also, and then also the, the company that did the work also just did an incredible job of really uh, exposing what work they did and how they went about that, which I thought was just mind blowingly cool. You know, so if you're interested in the security space or in Kubernetes or how, uh, or what they found, it's all here. Like if you're a consumer of Kubernetes, I, I, re I definitely recommend to read. Um, and I expect to see more and more of, uh, you know, I expect to see more information being communicated from the Kubernetes community and the, and, 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 CF, and CNCF like as we go through this. All right. Next up, we have attacking and defending Kubernetes with Ian Coldwater. She, they are the person that I um, presented with at uh, Black Hat on, um, on Kubernetes security. And so Ian is, a, an, again, an incredible engineer, um, a security engineer who's focused on protecting and, um, and attacking Kubernetes clusters they work at um, they work at uh, Heroku, which is a subsidiary of Salesforce, and it was just such a great experience to work through this. So prior to the um, prior to our Black Hat talk, this interview happened, and you know I definitely recommend giving it a listen. It was a great it was a great uh, discussion, and lots of interesting stuff happened in there. On we go. We have storage on Kubernetes. This is an article written by Vito. Boda, Boda, and um, explores some of the different storage options that are available and tries to kind of work through that whole set and, and describe and give people some context around storage. So I definitely recommend this read. I, I've, dug in through, I've dug through it and I thought it was actually really well researched and, and really well written. So definitely check that out. Tools and methods. The NCC group has defi um, has defined some tools and methods for auditing Kubernetes RBAC policies. So just like we talked about, right, in that CVE, right, some of the policies that you're granting, possibly granting to users who are who have access to Kubernetes clusters, are a little more than you expect them to be. And so, you know, definitely check out some of these tools for what for how to actually understand um, what a user can do and what access they have. So definitely worth checking out. I'm not sure if they call out one of my favorite. Yeah, they do. They have can I, um, and they have can I list. 
This is a relatively new feature. This is a relatively new feature in uh, the Kube Canal, the command line tool. Um, and what this does is it makes use of self-subject self access rules or self-subject rules review, which is a new API object in 1.13, I think it was, might've been 1.12. But what this does is it gives you the ability to enumerate all of the permissions that a user has. And so that's actually pretty great. Um, Definitely worth checking out. So we can see, you know, like we can see the permissions that uh, this particular user has are pretty wide ranging. Like in the output here, right, we can see that this person has access to do anything with any resource. So any verb, any resource, not filtered, right? And so this is a great article to read if you want to like just dig into RBAC and how it works and, or how it's supposed to work and that sort of thing. So. The Pinterest engineering team has been talking about uh, building a Kubernetes platform at Pinterest. So I know that Pinterest has been working on this to some to 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 a, a great extent. They've been working on it for some time. Uh, I've got some friends over there that are working on this very same thing, and so it's definitely worth reading how they got how they went about it and what they've learned in that process. You know, again, just kind of like the transparency again from the community. I can't I can't thank the community enough for just being really open and honest about. Uh, what they've experienced and what and what's happened in there. That's just incredible. So definitely a good read. And I think that is all for the week in review. All right. Um, we do have this slides for reconciliation. We're going to get to that. It's not going to be uh, the first part of it, though. We're going to dig into that a little bit later on. All right. Now, this is my show outline. And you can tell from the crazy checklist that it's pretty aggressive. <laughs> there's, there's a lot that I want to cover. Um, and, and, and I want to take a particular approach to it. But again, like what I'm going to try and uh, what I want people to come away with from this discussion are is the tools and the frame of reference with which to kind of explore Kubernetes as a system. And I'm trying to impart, you know, some of my understanding of how all of it works and, and you know, kind of get get that stuff out there. So to set the stage, um, there are a couple of things that, uh, that we're going to work through in this um, today as we as we work through this process. Um, the first I wanted to highlight, like uh, when I started exploring Kubernetes as a project, the first thing I did was actually start looking at it from the perspective of uh, understanding the system itself, the application that is Kubernetes. I spent my time focusing on how to understand that better and how to and how all the different pieces and parts work. And so we're going to start our conversation kind of in line with that with that model. Um, the way that I did that initially was that I actually, um, you know, I went through the process of uh, bringing up a Kubernetes cluster, leveraging tools that I had at my disposal at the time. And it wasn't, I, I didn't actually do the Kubernetes the hard way thing because at the time I was, I was actually working at CoreOS. And so we had Cube AWS and we also had uh, kind of the, the beginning of what Tectonic was. Um, and we were working pretty hard on kind of that model. And so I spent a bunch of my time just understanding how do we go about deploying all of these pieces and parts? How do we go about configuring all of these pieces and parts? And how do all of the pieces and parts work together? And so to that end, I spent a lot of my time on this page, um, and this page kind of comes out with every release. And so, this page, and there's also, bear with me while I flip some things around here. So if you just type in kubelet, you also get the reference for the command. So there's like, oh. yeah. So this page is updated with every release. And as we like change features or add features or modify stuff, um, this page is updated, right? And a lot of the times, if we're going to change something that is specific to the reference of one of these components that we actually, then, then um, this will also make the release notes. And so I think we have shown you that page before, but if we haven't, I definitely recommend looking at rel notes. 
www.khio.io if you're curious about how this works and it's kind of broken down by by some of the things that could be changed right so we have controller manager we have kubeadm kubectl kubelet cloud provider stuff we have api server we have ipvs which is related to kube proxy all of these tags are are here kind of for our for our use to kind of like filter down to those things that we're interested in understanding more about the changes for so definitely worth looking at this um, and understanding like what's out there. So if you click on the 115 tag inside of here, we can see only those things that are specific to 115 in the results. And we can understand like what things are being changed. So if Kubelet made a change or local storage made a change, this is a great way of kind of digging into that. But going back to our point before, we're going to start with the Kubelet. And we're going to talk about the kubelet specifically. So in the kubelet's instruction set, we have a, a brief overview of like what the uh, kubelet does. It's a node agent. It's a Go binary. It's, stat it's uh, statically compiled with everything that it needs to do its job. But it also relies on the existence of some of the other uh, uh, implementations within uh, a per node model, right? So it relies on things like container networking interface. It relies on things like your container runtime and any of the storage configurations that you have. But the actual implementation of like, you know, taking down a pod specification from, uh, from the API server and making it a real thing, that's the job of the kubelet and that's what the kubelet will do, right? So a brief overview of like what a kubelet does. There are three ways that a container manifest can be provided to the kubelet. The first, and this is, I mean, we're gonna talk about all three here, but there is a way to specify a, a, a file um, a, a file path to the kubelet, and this is actually kind of how static pods work. And so we're going to explore that here in a second. Um, when you create a static pod, the kubelet will take the responsibility of running and managing the lifecycle of that container directly. And so that's one way that pods can be created with by the kubelet. Another way is through the HTTP endpoint. Um, <clears throat> that HTTP endpoint is basically, it does provide the ability to expose the kubelet's API such that you can use that API to create containers. This one is really not used very often at all, but it does exist. And then the third one is the HTTP server where the kubelet can, all, where, where the kubelet will, um, you know, interact with the server, with the API server and do a watch and keep an eye on, keep an eye out for pods that are associated with itself and download the manifest associated with that pod once it has determined that there's work for it to do, and then apply, and then bring that thing up. And we're gonna kind of walk through a couple of those examples um, when, we are, when we are exploring the kubelet. And then the other thing that they highlight here, which I think is definitely worth understanding, is the pod lifecycle event generator. And to give you a quick overview of what uh, Plague does, uh, what it does is it's, it's a call, it's a, it's a control loop that happens inside of the kubelet that interacts with the container runtime, and it tries to understand are all of the all of the containers that the kubelet has started up running, or 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 has there been any lifecycle change or lifecycle event associated with those containers in the intervening time between the time that the control loop runs, right? So this is a way for the kubelet to get fresh information about what's happening with the container runtime, its hard dependency around like, are all the things still working or not working? Um, and Plague has proven difficult to work with over the years, but I think it's actually calmed down quite a lot. Uh, but as you can imagine, effectively what this is, is that the, it's the kubelet making use of the Docker or the container runtime uh, interface to understand the status of all of the running containers. And the way that it does this is it basically calls out through, that, through, through uh, a shim mechanism to say, okay, just like we would say Docker PS, the kubelet's doing a Docker PS to understand all of the running containers and mapping that back to the status of those containers. And then the kubelet will report up the running state of all of those, all of those containers. And if it sees an event lifecycle in the happen in between, it will actually take action, right? It'll say, oh, I lost this container, the container's lost, or we'll try to restart the container depending on the configuration of the pod manifest itself. So we've talked a little bit about how that part of it works, like static pods and pulling down manifests from the, the cluster. I also want to actually uh, 
show you that in 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 real time on a on a cluster. So we're going to jump over to our terminal, and I'm going to show you those two things, and then we're going to move on to some of the command line options, which I think are also very important to talk about. So. We have our Kubernetes cluster, kubectl git nodes. Oop. Mm, kubectl. Oh, you know what it is? Um, anybody know what it's going to be? Because <laughs> I called the cluster kind, kind this time, not APIs. Oh, my bad. Dear m dot allow. So here's our nodes. All right, we have. Um, three workers and a control plane node. And they're all kind of running in a not ready state. Now, I wanted to point this out because I think it's actually kind of important that we understand how this works, right? And so if I do kubectl get pods, all namespaces, I can see that there are some things that are running and some things that are not. Um, what's important to understand when we're looking at this initial view is that I have not deployed a container networking interface at this time, right? Each of my nodes has a container runtime running, but none of them has a container networking interface configured. And that's what's keeping us from becoming ready when we look at the nodes. Now, I'm highlighting this because it's going to be a part of the Kubelet conversation, right? <clears throat> when it's frequently thought that a node has to become ready before you can do anything useful with it. And we can see from this output already that that is not the case, right? Um, I can see in my output when I do kubectl dash capital A um, pods get, that there are pods running, that there are, there are things consuming resources, right? And I can see that they're up and running and, and operating just fine. And now what I want to do is I want to take a look at um, how those things are running. And, and like what and how and the configuration of the kubelet and how that works. Now, before I move on to that part of it, I do want to highlight that we can see that the core DNS pods themselves are not running. So what do you think is the difference between the core DNS pods and all of the other pods that are in a running state? I know that this is a lot of information quickly, but I think it'll be helpful. Anybody have a guess? A gander about what that could be? I will give you a hint. Get pause dash a dash o wide. Let me shrink that a little bit so we can actually. There, there we go. So the trick to it is that we can see that um, if we look at those IP addresses and then we do kubectl get nodes dash o wide. Those IP addresses are the no, are the IP addresses of the nodes. So each of these things that is running is actually using host network true. So these pods are all running with host network true. As an example, let's take a look at this manifest right here, right? I can do kubectl get pod dash n kube system that manifest dash o yaml. And I can look at the manifest that is represented. Oh, Vim. And I can look at the, the, the manifest that is presented for this particular pod, right? Now your point, your your point actually, Suresh, is correct. This is a static pod, and we're going to get to that in a second. But the important part here is not that it's a static pod. The important part is that it has host network true, right? Because of that, we're not reliant on the CNI to exist before the container is created. Right? This is actually the way that, um, this is one of the interesting things about kubelets, right? You don't necessarily need a CNI to schedule work on a kubelet. You need um, host network true so that you're not pinned behind the CNI. And that's actually what's happening with those other uh, pods right now. Core DNS, that, that pod, kubectl get pod dash n kube system. The core DNS pod dash o yaml vim. This pod 
is actually not host network true, right? So if I go down here and I look at the, the network configuration here, I just do a search for host network. Right? It's not set, which means by default it's false. And so the core DNS pods are not going to come up until there is a, um, a, a container networking interface configured on those nodes. I hope that makes sense. So that's actually part of the way, I mean, kind of an interesting thing about the Qubit. Now let's talk about static manifests and, or static manifests and how they work. And we're also going to kind of explore the Qubit itself. Um, so I'm going to Docker exec into a place where I have a control, a Qubit running. In this case, it's just going to be the control plane. I could be do, I could do this actually, you know what, let's do it on a worker instead. Kind worker bash. Now, to start off, how do we understand that the Qubit is running, other than the fact that we can see it registered, right? Most of the time, it's run as a as a, as a, a systemd unit, right? So if I do cat Qubit, I can see the configuration of the Qubit as it, as it is configured by systemd. And if I do journal kettle minus flu, uh, so journal kettle minus flu, Cubelet. I can follow the log of the cubelet and see what the logs are of the of that cubelet directly. Right. And so it's right now it's complaining that there's no directory for Etsy Kubernetes manifests, which segues perfectly to what we're going to be doing. So I'm going to do make dear dash p do journal kettle minus flu, and now we don't see that error anymore. But we do see an error talking about container runtime not running, right? And so it's unable to actually start anything inside of um, anything that would require it, right? So the the kubelet is not ready because a network plug plugin returns error CNI not initialized. Now before we go too far uh, too far forward from where we are, I want to actually highlight. That's true. Uh, I do want to highlight that. Um, give me one second here, and I'll show ABC's method. Show. All right, cool. I do want to highlight that the Qubit's Qubit has quite a bit more logs than we are seeing in this output, right? And so let's take a look again at that system CTL. System sys, system CTL cat Qubit. And if we look at the command line options, which are going to be defined, excuse me, here, we can see I forgot that kind doesn't have Vim or any of that stuff installed. So give me just one second. Apt install Vim. So we can, I believe, see the verbosity. It does not appear that it is actually defined here. Go back to our system. And again, like this is really specific to the way that KubeADM configures these things, right? And so depending on your, uh, the way that you've deployed Kubernetes, it may be different for you than it is for, for um, this kubelet, right? So I'm going to do cat, take a look at this one. And that is again, just looking at where the container D socket is and the fail to swap on node, but you can see that it is also passing arguments to the kubelet. Let's take a look at that output one more time. So this is the argument right here that describes where all of the arguments that we're using to start the kubelet are located, right? So we're looking for these environment variables that are defined inside of the file. Um, we have kubelet config args defined, kubelet, con uh, kubelet cube config args, and Etsy default kubelet 
So all of those things are defined. But we don't see anything that would actually set the verbosity of the cubelet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and add that argument. And to do that, we're going to go back to the argument here. Or we're going to go back to the, the um, kind of the man for for cubelet and look for log level And here we see the one the argument I'm looking for, which is a dash v level, goes all the way up to 10, just like most of the other things within Kubernetes. And if we bump the verbosity up, we get a lot more information about what's happening with this specific cubelet. And I think that for me, when characterizing what's actually happening with um, a tool, a, a component like the cubelet, it's really important to be able to actually see better logs. So I'm going to bump it up to eight, which is a lot of logs. Actually, let's just bump it up to three and see what we see. When you're doing this with system, when you're doing, doing this with system D, you kind of need to like do a reload and then you can do a restart of cubelet. And then we can do that same journal kettle uh, command, journal kettle minus FLU cubelet. And we're getting more information about what's actually happening here. And so we're getting more verbose logs from the cubelet right now. So as it comes up and gets fired up here. So let's like, take a look at that static pod manifest and see what we're actually seeing um, with static pods. So if we go into our Kubernetes manifest directory, which is defined as an argument to kubelet, and we do a curl for git.io etcd client.yaml, which is just a etcd configure, uh, an etcd pod that I've built as a static pod. Um, HTTPS. Oh, I'm dumb sometimes. You know how it is. Minus LO. So I'm going to take a look at that manifest real quick, and we'll look at that. And so here I have, I'm defining a pod, just like you would if you're going to interact with the Kube, the Kube API. I'm giving it labels. I'm giving it a namespace to be associated with. I'm giving it a command. Uh, I'm grabbing the etcd image uh, and um, mounting in some directories in the underlying host. I'm setting host path to true, or a host network to true. And I'm using host path to mount a directory that may or may not exist where I was going to get the credentials to authenticate to the etcd server. And we'll talk about what I would use this for. That's basically a debug tool for interacting with etcd that is pre-configured for the way that kubeadm configures etcd. So we're going to talk about that later. But, but first, the interesting part. So let's go back to our logs. And we can see... Your eye kettle pods. We can see that that etcd client kind work. That etcd client was created, and that the naming scheme for when pods that are static pods are created is to give you some indication of what node is actually starting that static pod. We can see that it's associated with a namespace, and that the and that the pod has come up right. And so if I exit out of this node and I do cube kettle get pods dash A, I can see my etcd client kind worker. And because this is a static pod, it's being managed by the underlying kubelet. Right? And so one of the kind of interesting things here, uh, let's see if I can split horizontally. See, I want to Control A question mark. Okay, split. 
Control A percent. Cube. Okay. Control A percent. Ha ha! Victory. Okay. So cube kettle watch. Actually, let's jump jump. Let's jump back into that worker real quick. What I'm trying to show you here is one of the interesting things about static pods, and then we'll move forward. So I'm going to do Docker exec ti kind worker bash. And I'm going to do a watch CRI kettle uh, ps. And we can see that etcd client is up, and it's been up for two minutes, right? And we can see that cube proxy is up, and it's been up for about an hour since I started the cluster. Now, um, let's go ahead and try to kill that pod using cube kettle. Now, this is an interesting thing about static pods. Hmm. Even more fun. Control a question. And then, Down one pane. Control A tab. Control A tab. All right, cool. All right, so we have our SD client watch going, and now we're going to do cube kettle delete pod dash n kube system we're going to get rid of that etcd client pod now most of the people who are used to working with kubernetes at this point are expecting that etcd client pod to die but it does not any guesses why that is this is because for static pods they're entirely owned and operated by the kubelet the kubelet doesn't even have to ever see the API server. Exactly, they are not API server controlled. They're controlled entirely by the kubelet, um, which means that they can be disconnected or brought back up, whatever. It's the kubelet is managing those static manifests directly. Now, what's another interesting point is how, what that means for admission control, right? Um, what that means for admission control is that the, this particular pod is instantiated before admission control happens. Right? A static pod is initiated before admission control happens. Admission control in this case means that the kubelet has started the pod and is operating it, and then it tries to report up to the API server that a pod is running. And that reporting, that ability to actually register this running pod with the API server, that is the form of admission control. And so as you can imagine, anything that would constrain a pod, like what a pod can do or what the pod can request, is ignored with static pods. Static pods are created no matter what. Whether you have admission control or not, they are created. What the admission control does is determine whether or not we report that pod into the cluster. Interesting point, just wanted to highlight that. Okay, so just as an example, um, let's do kube kettle get pods dash in, uh, dash in kube system dash o wide grep kind worker in a negative space. So here's our a pod that is managed by the API server. And I wanted to highlight what happens when I delete that one, just so you can see like a, a valid comparison here, right? So delete pod dash n kube system. Oops, and there it went, right? So we can see that that pod got deleted because it was actually killed off by kube kettle and because that pod was managed by the API server, right? And now four seconds ago, it was redeployed because again, the kubelet was able to determine that the kubelet was able to determine minus FLU kubelet 
Cubit was able to determine that it needed to run that pod and that that pod was not running. And so it made a decision to start that one up again. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to exit out of this tab. So we have a full window again. I'm going to docker exec into that worker. And I'm going to do grep minus IR, or actually, yeah, Q proxy. And we can see what the, um, the cubelet has done here, right? So it said waiting for volumes to attach for this. Not giving me all the logs. Wow. What if I do? BZTA. Woo. Definitely not what I meant. Journal kettle minus FLU cubelet grep BZZT. Oh, there we go. I'm being silly. Okay, got it. All right, so here's our all of our logs, right? So we can say kill or stop. So these are all the all the all the all of the logs for um, that we have for bringing up cube proxy here, right? And so this is the creation of it, and then we have a sync loop that is adding the adding the object to the API server right here. That's what that is, and then we see the token being generated and mounting things. Or not, the token's not being generated, it was generated by the token controller inside the cluster. You see all of that stuff happening. What I was looking for was, there we go. So we, updated, we updated it successfully. Got X table lock. I was trying to see the delete event. It's probably further down. There we go. Containers to kill map. All right. So there is uh, the kill pod requ the request coming in from the API server saying, "Go ahead and delete this thing," and then the API server and then the cubelet goes 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 ahead and does that, deletes that pod, and then we see um, it pulling down the manifest again and beginning the process of running that pod again, and so. Bumping the logs up, we can really understand the life cycle of a, of a given um, uh, creation of a pod. So like, that's what I wanted to share with you all. This is like one way of understanding, really digging into the detail for how the cubelet itself works. Um, and this could be done for, you could use the same output to look at cube proxy, or you could do it for etcd client. And you could see how, um, how that would be useful in both in both situations, right? So cubelet sync loop again, determining that a pod needs to be created. It goes ahead and creates it, right? It says can't. It's kind of funny. Unable to process. I don't know why that would be there, but it was able to process it. Probably it wasn't. Maybe the file had been created first, and then yeah. Anyway, the pod did get created, and we saw it get running. Now. That's how that works. One more thing I wanted to show you, to kind of in relation to the way that static pods work, um, Kubernetes manifests. Let's go ahead and edit this manifest because this highlights how things are changed, right? So I'm going to change the, the namespace that this pod is actually in. 
Let's go ahead and put it in the default namespace. Get pods. Right. And so what happened there was it saw that the configuration in that manifest changed. And it removed that object from the from the cube system namespace and moved that object to the default namespace. Now, before I move on from here, I just want to highlight, like, think about that for a second. Um, I've created a static pod that's in the default namespace. And what does that mean for RBAC? Interesting stuff, right? Anybody with access to the default namespace can now exec or log or attach to that pod that is running in host path on the underlying node. So static pods are an interesting surface to explore. Is there any way to see what the contents are inside the etcd store at a given time? Yes, there are. And in fact, why don't we just do that real quick before we move on? I have a lot to cover and it's already two and we have so much more to cover, but we're going to keep going. So um, docker exec the kind worker bash rm etsy kubernetes manifest etsy client exit. Let's jump back into the contract. Now, because I'd have to actually validate that against the control plane, let's go ahead and do that. So we're going to do docker exec PI kind control plane bash. Let's see, Kubernetes manifest curl minus lo git.io etcd clients dot yaml exit exit. And then uh, what this manifest actually does is it gives us the ability pre-configured to interact with etcd. So I can now exec ti bash n kube system etcd client bash or shell and do etcd ctl get from key keys only grep secrets. So this is a way of actually interacting with with etcd directly pre-configured because it's all configured inside the environment. Um, but that's what that tool does. Right? So I'd actually be able to like interact with the entire system. Pretty cool stuff. So that is how that works. It's really cool. All right, moving on. Let's go back to our checklist and see where we are. We have talked about the theory of operation. I still want to show you some of this other stuff. Before we move on, and we actually talked about static pods and plague, we have, these are the things I want to talk about. Now, these are the interfaces of this particular component before we move on. Let's talk about how Kubelet client and server auth work against the, uh, the Kubelet itself. So, the Kubelet expresses an API. In fact, there was a really interesting CVE some time ago. Kubelet API CVE. This was like, this was some time ago. This is like, gosh, uh, 2018, I guess. Yeah, last year, forever ago. It was like back when dinosaurs roamed the earth. Anyway, uh, I'm being a little facetious. What this does is it highlights the fact that um, there we go. At the time, I don't know if I'm going to dig into this. At the time, what was happening was that you had the ability to interact with the Kubelet API directly to do things like exec in uh, using a curl command, or um, or just interact with the API server directly. So. Before we get too far down that path, I want to talk about what that actually means. So let's go back to our shell again, right? And do kubectl get pods dash uh, a dash o wide. And we can see, and let's look at our worker again. Grep work, worker. So we can see this pod running here, this kube proxy pod, right? And if I actually just do kubectl run nginx dash n, uh, Image engine X replicas three pods. Here's my engine X pods dash O wide. 
And then as soon as that gets deployed, we'll be able to see them running. So there are a bunch of different commands that kubectl that kubelet or sorry kubectl gives you, right? You have commands like exec, logs, attach, cp, um, Those are the big ones. Attach CP. Those commands that I've highlighted here, right? So kubectl exec logs attach CP. These commands actually are expressed by the kubelets API. I'm going to say that again. These commands are expressed and implemented by the kubelet API. The API server is just proxying these commands toward the destination API, uh, toward the destination kubelet. So when I type kubectl exec dash ti, uh, kubectl, let's do our get pods again, kubectl get pods. Why is it taking so long to do that? Come on. Get with it, people. Oh, because I'm dumb. Keep get all edit deployment dash n. I even told you this was going to happen, and I still did. What can I do? Host network true. Probably some other priority thing I'm missing. Does not have a minimum availability. Is progressing. So for now, I'm actually just going to go ahead and deploy a, a, a CNI so we can just get past that part, right? So. Um, Then grab the canal manifests. Get all apply dash F. Get all get pods dash W. Now we have canal downloading. Starting up, and we have our Nginx pod starting up. And you notice that even though the pod, the nodes were still in an unready state, can now got deployed. And 
so inside of the Kubernetes cluster, we've actually initialized a CNI and all of the running nodes. Waiting for things to get started up here. And I think we're pretty much there at this point. All right, cool. So kubectl get pods dash uh, o wide. And we can see these two are sitting on the kind worker. And they're kind of transitioning right now between host network and. All right, so kind worker here. So when I exec into this pod, what's actually happening is that I'm making use of the kubelet API to uh, interact with the, the, the pod itself, right? So if I do kubectl exec ti uh, tr uh, sh, right? Now this connection is actually a, a connection in the kubelet. And to highlight that, I want to uh, control, so control a percent, and then we'll do docker exec kind worker bash ps minus ef grep neck uh, CRI kettle. Well, I guess you can't see there, can you? PS. Is there a way for me to show you this? Journal kettle minus u. Cubelet. And then the nginx. Crap. Yeah. Hmm. Hard for me to show you. That is being that is being proxied through SS minus LN. The connection would come through here. TUP. So Kubelet is listening on 10, 248 and 1056 grep Kubelet. We can see the Kubelet is listening on 10248 and 10250. And we look at the connections, grep 10248. You can see this connection coming from zero five and control A tab. Get all get nodes that show wide. And zero five is our worker. And zero three is our control plane. So there is our connection right there. That is the one. Where, um, where the connection is actually coming in and establishing, right? So if I go back and I do that again, Control A tab. And I go back here and connect again. So there's our proxy right there. So that's our connection into the kubelet using the kubelet API to establish that connection, right? And so that's actually how that, um, the, that's the API server authenticating to the kubelet to get this connection going. Now, one of the other interesting thing, outputs of this, right, is how the, how the API server authenticates to the kubelet. So that is defined by the way that the API server is connected or is, is uh, 
configured, and it's also defined by the way that the worker is configured, because we have a server side and a client side. In this case, the server side is the kubelet, and the client side is the API server, not kubectl, but the API server. So the connection is, I use kubectl to authenticate and uh, connect to the API server, and then the API server proxies my connection to the kubelet to allow me to make use of the kubelet's API to do an attach or an exec on that um, on that pod. But the identity is lost in the meantime, right? So if I look at the source of the identity connected to the API, the, this pod right now, it's gonna be the API server, not kubectl. That's what I wanna highlight. This connection path is kubectl to the API server. API server proxies me once it's gone through the authoriz authorization and authentication process, it proxies me to the kubelet where I can uh, interact with the, the container directly. Okay, cool stuff. Wanted to show you that. Let's talk about how the authentication part works though, because that is also kind of interesting, right? So if I do um, curl minus LO, do I have JQ? Nope. I have to install JQ. Okay, so I can do curl minus LO. Ten to fifty. So it's probably gonna be easier to do this from outside. So I'm gonna close this window. And what I want to show you is like how the kubelet itself is configured. Now, there are a couple of different ways to look at this. And we've already looked at it the one way, right? If we exec into the container, if we exec into our worker, kind docker exec ti kind worker bash, and we do system ctl cat kubelet, we can see where all of the configuration files necessary for this kubelet are located. And we can see and we can go and so we could go through each of them and understand how they're configured now these are the source of truth right now right so the kubeadm flags and the stuff that's in varlib kubelet config.yaml that defines how these things are actually configured but there is another way that is interesting to understand how the kubelet is configured let's explore what that looks like get nose dash o yaml grep self so I'm going to use kubectl to understand how the kubelet is configured. So I'm going to do kubectl get raw proxy config z jq dot and then bim dash. So what this is going to do is I'm going to use kubectl get and then this dash raw extension to form my own URL, which is going to be referenced to the upper uh, to the API server. So it's going to be API v1 nodes kind worker slash proxy telling telling us that I want a proxy to again to that kubelet directly. And I want to use, oh, and I want to see the output of the paths on that listening server config z. And I want to, uh, because I know the output will be JSON, I'm going to use JQ to decode it and put it into a pretty output. And then I'm going to use Vim to look at it. So this is another way of looking at the configuration of the kubelet directly. And this config Z endpoint exists on the kubelet. It exists on the uh, cube proxy. It exists on, I believe it's just those two right now, the cube proxy and the kubelet. It might be the controller manager or the scheduler, but I don't believe so. I believe it's just those two, cube proxy and kubelet allow for dynamic configuration. And this is one way of understanding how the kubelet is configured. So we can see these things directly. Now, there is a, there is a practice in place where we can actually uh, dynamically reconfigure the kubelet, but most implementations don't use that today. They use the configuration on disk. So all this really highlights is our ability to understand how that is configured, not necessarily to modify it. All right, so that's kubelet, its configuration. Before we move on, I also want to show you the metrics that can be exposed. So again, I'm going to use proxy, and I'm going to look at the metrics endpoint. Uh, 
Now, this is an interesting one. This is, these are the metrics that are exposed by the Cuba directly. The Cuba is, is um, instrumented with Prometheus, and we can see all of those things that the Cubelet exposes as metrics. Um, and these are very useful information when you're like trying to understand just how the Cubelet's working or uh, operating. I've used this output in a firefighting mode to understand like for a specific Cubelet, give me the situation when I'm trying to understand how it's actually operating, right? And so this is a great way of understanding it. Um, this will also highlight kind of the, the REST client request and what the, what the requests were to the Cubelet, what has actually happened in the past, it, it does provide quite a lot of interesting output. Um, I think actually, it would even show us that connection. Because I think it actually does highlight those are the attached volumes. Anyway, have fun with the metrics, have fun with the config. Those are all things that are there. And then lastly, the, last, the, other, the other one that's there is this uh, health Z, telling us whether the, 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 um, the cubit is in a healthy state or not, based on its own parameters. So those are the three things that are um, exposed by the cubit. Uh, there's also a debug. Uh, there's also a debug endpoint exposed by the cubelet, but generally it's turned off by default. Um, if you do need to turn that on, that would also be available at that path. Now to understand something real quick, right? The dash V8. So I'm interacting with the cubelet. Uh, health Z. But this call is going directly to the um, the cubelet again, right, to get that to, to to get the resulting response. And it looks to me, from my outside view, as though the response is coming back from the API server. But that's only because we're proxying back from the API server. That's what I wanted to highlight. Yeah. If the cubelet were run as a container, yes. But since the cubelet is not a containerized process, and really running a cubelet as a containerized process is a huge pain to the bottom. Uh, it's it's not super possible to do that. I'll, although actually, I forgot about this. It is is it logs? Uh, yeah, there's also a logs endpoint, but it only highlights those uh, the things that are. It doesn't it doesn't actually express the kubeless logs itself just those things that uh, it, it is responsible for expressing up to the up to the um, up to the pot up to the API server right so here's how the logs attach work right so like we can actually so instead of doing kubectl uh, logs I could actually look at the logs directly Um, but yeah, like that's effectively how that's working as we're, we're getting the access that way to do it. So that's the Kubelet API. Let's go back and check that one off the box and then we'll move on. We talked about configs, we talked about metrics, we talked about the Kubelet API, we talked about CRI, we talked about client server auth in relation to the way that the API server authenticates to the Kubelet but not completely. Um, let's go back to the instructions here. And I want to highlight the configuration parameters within the kubelet that are used to secure kubelet authentication. So things coming in to authenticate to the kubelet. Um, Let's go back to here. So I'm looking again at the configuration of the kubelet. 
right? It's got this static pod manifest path. It's got um, a TLS cert uh, file and private key file. These are the certificates that are being used for the kubelet to authenticate to the API server, right? This is the certificate used by the kubelet to authenticate to the API server. And these are going to be rotated by default, right? So these are actually a part uh, in kubeadm. These are actually uh, brought to you by an implementation called Bootstrap TLS. So as the, when you run kubeadm join, we actually mint a CSR based for this kubelet. And we put that CSR up in the cluster. The cluster will automatically approve that CSR and we will get a signed kubelet client key that the kubelet will use to authenticate to the API server. And then it will know that the API server is um, signed by validating against the, the CA file here. So that's the path of how kubelet authenticates to API server. It has these keys, a certificate and a private key. So it's using MTLS to authenticate to the kubelet, to the kube API server. And it's validating that the API server's key or uh, certificate is signed by a known CA cert. Now, there's another piece to this here, right, where we talk about like how authentication works. So these are things that are going to authenticate to the kubelet. If you have a client that's coming in that's signed by the CA cert, we're going to trust it. And then we're going to um, enable a webhook to authenticate whether or not the user has is authorized to do things. Sorry, this webhook is about uh, token authentication. So we have two different forms of authentication that we're highlighting here. One is the client certificate coming in signed by a CA cert. So when the Cube API server authenticates to the Kubelet's API, it's actually going to use a client certificate that is signed by the CA cert, and that will get it authenticated. If I wanted to use a, a token, a service account token to authenticate to the API server, that would be supported by the webhook. And that's authentication or auth n. How does authorization work against the Kubelet API? Cube, the Kubelet API is only authorized by webhook. And the way the webhook works is it will actually, when it, it will introspect the authorized user to understand who that user is and what permissions they have, right? So if we're looking at the client cert that comes in and it says, I am the, uh, you know, I am a, a, a Q, uh, I am part of system masters, the group, right? Then I can, uh, then what will happen is the kubelet will actually call out to the API server and say, is system masters authorized to do an exec or a logs or an attach? And if it is authorized, then it will allow the connection to continue. And if it is not authorized, if I'm coming in as like my own credential, right, that doesn't have exec access or proxy access to the Kubelet API, then I will get denied. There's one more important part before we move on, which I think is interesting. Now, um, I'm not sure it's highlighted in this configuration. I thought that it was. No, it is not. So because we have not specified what the serving cert or serving key are going to be, then by default what happens is it's a self-signed serving certificate for the Kubelet API, meaning that the serving certificate is not secured by the CA cert in the cluster, it's just self-signed. So we're using that as a mechanism only to encrypt traffic to the Kubelet not necessarily to validate trust for that traffic. All right. Um, now, there are ways that you can configure the kubelet such that it would actually automatically generate a CSR for the serving certificate as well, but we don't have a way of actually validating who the kubelet is, so we don't feel comfortable providing the, the kubelet a signed serving certificate without having some third-party ver verification. You can dig in here through all of the command line tools and understand like what each of these pieces does. It's all highlighted here. And um, it describes quite a lot of the configuration options of the kubelet. Now, the, I've covered a number of them, 
Uh, a number of what I think the, are the important ones just to understand runtime for the cubelet, but this is just the cubelet part. All right, it's 2.30 now. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Since I, I took on way too much, I think, to dig into it this week. We might end up turning this into a series because I'm not sure that I'll have time to get through all of it. Uh, obviously, I'm not going to have time to get through all of it in one episode. But let's move on for now. Um, so much more to talk about. Okay, so we've covered pretty much everything in my list for the cubelet. We understand that the cubelet is going to implement things like manifests, and it's going to, and it has three different ways to get those manifests into the cubelet. We have a way via the watch mechanism. We have a way via the static pod mechanism, and there's also an API mechanism, which which you can actually define manifest that we run on that cubelet directly. What do y'all think? Should we keep going? Do you want to pick up another component before we stop for the day or or should we or or should we um or should we call it here at cubelet and then pick this up again as a series? What do you what do y'all let me get a vote real quick. Keep plugging away for a little bit or call it for the day and do the series thing. Josh is a plus one on the series. One more component and then plus series. All right, great. Thank you, Bogdan. Let's pick up the cube proxy. Okay. <clears throat> so much stuff to talk about. I mean, I could talk about Cubelet for quite a bit more. There's obviously like a bunch of you know, before we do that, let's just finish, let's just talk a little more about Cubelet and talk through some of these command line parameters. So we've talked about how um, Cubelet is interacting with things. Let's talk about how the Cubelet is configured to understand its um, container runtime. Like, how does it actually know what container runtime it's going to interact with? Whew, so many arguments. All right. And typically that's done through this argument, the container runtime endpoint, and that tells us what uh, what shim to use to interact with the API server. Now, if you're using kubeadm directly to interact or to configure this, the runtime Is actually implemented and notified at least in the configuration of the node. Get on get node q kind worker dash oemo. Up here at the top, we have some configuration that is specific to the node, including this piece, which is a, an implementation of kubeadm that informs us about what the actual container run dot container D socket is, right? So this tells us that this particular node is actually using container D as the container runtime. And, and it also informs the, the kubelet how to actually, um, how to authenticate to it. Now this is, I mean, this, this notification here is actually just for our purposes as operators. So we can see like how this kubelet is configured. It's good information for us to understand. The node info output, does tell us what what version of container D is running and like the, the container runtime that's actually been specified. But how do you think we tell Kubelet what container runtime to use? So inside here, there's probably going to be something that is actually configured by presumably kubeadm that is telling this particular kubelet to use container D to authenticate, right? So let's take a look and see if we can find it. So in our case, kubeadm has actually saved our bacon, right? So what the what, what kubeadm does 
is it will actually determine that the container runtime running on this node is container D or Docker or what have you. And it will configure the kubelet for us to allow the kubelet to actually interact with that particular given runtime. In our case, we have container D already running on the underlying node as part of our prerequisite. And we've configured container D, container D socket um, to uh, as part of the kubelet kubeadm arguments. Now there's a couple of different ways this could have happened. Let's see. Let's jump back into our controller again. Right. See. And let's take a look at se or kind kubeadm.conf. Ah, I see. Okay, so kubeadm in this case isn't actually doing this automatically. It's doing this with the node registration argument, right? So kubeadm has been configured to use kubeadm or to use container D directly. I believe that kubeadm does have a way of understanding it automatically if it doesn't if it isn't provided. But in our case, this is actually a configured uh, configured as part of kubeadm. And we'll probably talk about kubeadm in this series as well. But suffice to say, the way that the kind the kind worker knows or the way that the worker knows how to um, how to interact with the exec find docker exec ti kind worker bash there we go the way that it knows how to configure it, I mean, the way that it knows um, how to interact with container runtime is through this configuration right here, right? We're also telling it what IP the node IP has. This is all part of the configuration of the uh, uh, of this particular kubelet, and it makes up the way that the kubelet is actually um, interacting with things. Now, container D is actually can be interacted with CRI kennel with a little bit of configuration. So um, that's actually how we can interact with the with the um, container runtime on this node and see how it's actually running. And container D is also interesting because it gives you information about the namespace and it also gives you information about the running pods and what their names are. And if I do Sierra Kettle uh, PS, which is more like the Docker PS command, I can see what I would expect from Docker output. That is how Kubelet knows about container runtime. But how does Kubelet know about container networking interface? So let's again go back to that, to our configuration, wirelib kubelet config.yaml. Grep. I believe that one is actually set in default. So if we look at here, all right, no. Which means it's probably the default. So the default for Kubelet itself, right? It has a default for the CNI bin directory and a default for the CNI conf directory. We're looking for CNI plugins like flannel and those things to be in opt CNI bin. And we're looking for the configuration directory to be in Etsy CNI net D. So let's go look in those two places on our host. There is a directory opt CNI bin and there we have our plugins, right? So the ones that are actually running as part of our our containers are mounted in. So there's flannel and calico. And these are the two pieces that make up canal. And how are they configured? So this is our configuration for the, um, the canal configuration. And so we have our 10 canal conf list. And this is actually something that the um, kubelet is going to use to understand how to um, configure 
the CNI or to, or to interact with the CNI, right? Now, one thing that's interesting about this is, and I'm not super excited about it, but what this does is it, it configures Calico, which is great, but it also requests a cube config. So if I looked at that, CNI net.d Calico cube config, this is actually a full on cube config that the that um, Canal has configured for the use that that will be used by um, the Kubelet. So this is all just part of the CNI mechanism. But what I wanted to point out was like how um, Kubelet would interact with the container runtime and how Kubelet understands where the container networking interface is, right? And so that's where all of that stuff is. Storage. So there's also some information about where the, where the storage driver configuration is held and like where it's configured. Um, but definitely just reading through all of these command line arguments and understanding what they do, I think is helpful. Even if what you do is just read what the terms are and how they're configured and what the defaults are, I think that's helpful, right? So in our case, like if it's, if it's, if a default false, I'm not worried about reading it, but if there's a default that actually has a setting, let's say, let's take a look at the pod limit, for example. This is a great example. Pod limit. Uh, it's called count. I want to show you this max pods. Mm. There we go. So this argument max pods has a default of 110. This is a really interesting default argument to look at. That means that I can actually spin up 110 pods on this node. Um, Oh, okay. So Lubomir, who's one of my coworkers here at VMware, actually informs me that it will only tell it, it will only configure automatically uh, if you have Docker shim installed. It won't it won't determine that you have containerd and, and configure it for you. Okay, that's good to know. I thought that, that was something we were working on. Um, this match pods argument tells us how many pods we can actually run on the kubelet by default. Right? Um, and sometimes that's actually adjusted. So like if you're using the AWS ENI uh, CNI, this will actually be adjusted for you because it won't run more pods than you can actually have network interfaces for. So interesting output. But yeah, stuff that has defaults is good to understand if you're trying to dig into like what's actually happening. The other one that's interesting is the pod infra container image, K8 GCR pause in uh, the pause image. All right, let's one more thing about the kubelet, and then I think I'm actually probably going to call it a, an episode. We talked about the CRI, we talked about the CNI. If we do CRI kettle PS minus A. I'm not sure how to get CRI to show me the pause containers. Unless it doesn't have them. PS minus EF grip. Pause. Yeah, they are running. Okay. Let's talk about the makeup of a contain of a pod real quick, and this is actually kind of digging into the implementation of a, a little bit of detail about the way that pods are instantiated by the kubelet. Before we move on, um, <clears throat> when we instantiate a pod with the kubelet, 
Typically speaking, that means that we're going to end up with at least, at the very least, two running containers. We're going to have a container that represents the infrastructure container and a container that represents the container that you've highlighted in your pod specification where your code resides or the, the container image that we're going to download and run. Um, now, what that means is that there is a pause container generally running. Um, and if we go back to our manifest, we can see that the pause container used by default is this kh.gcr.io slash pause.3.1. And I want to highlight what that does, right? What that does is just a little C program that runs at its own container and it will actually um, just keep that container alive. And then what we associate with that container is a set of namespaces that may or may not be shared with the other pods inside of that implementation. So when we spin up this infrastructure container, it is to that infrastructure container that we would mount volumes. It would, it would be to that infrastructure container that we would mount things like the network namespace. When we define the infra infrastructure container, we're going to associate the network namespace that will be shared across all of the pods and the volumes that are attached to all of the pods to that in infrastructure container. And then from that container, we will, we will associate uh, those volumes and network and other C groups with the actual running containers within your pod. So what that means, let's just take a look at this real quick. So PS minus EF. What I'm looking for E941, I was assuming that we would be able to see the pod. And its relationship with that particular container with CRI kettle, which is a little harder to see with container D than it is with Docker D. So I might have to show that in Docker D. But these pods containers. Well, let's do this. Let's do pgrip pods and then cat or ls. SE 6626. I'm oh, sorry, not Etsy. Proc. NS. I'm going to grab that net ID and I'm going to do uh, find dash I name proc. Oh, these are all running as hostnet. <laughs> these are all running as hostnet. Let's do this. kubectl delete uh, deployment nginx kubectl run nginx image nginx Replicas three, kubectl get pods dash o, actually dash o wide. So we have our pod back on kind worker and it's running with its own IP, a 10.244 or overlay IP, which is why I needed to, I needed to see that so that we understand that it's in its own networks. 
So now we can do our Shirai Kettle PS minus again. We can also do PS minus EF. Okay. So there's our Nginx process, right, that we saw before. Let's do cat proc ns. Actually, we need ls minus al net. Now we're going to look for that one. So ls minus al proc star ns net grep. And so now we have three different. Uh, uh, implementations here, right? We have one for the the process. So let's do this. We'll do cat proc 20163cmd. So there's our pause container, and that is us associating that particular uh, container process with this with with this um, with this network namespace. And if we look at the command line for this other process, the 20215, right? So cat proc 20215 command line. That'll be the Nginx process. And that's the interesting thing, right? So that each of these things are associated with the same network namespace. And the one that got it first was the pause container, right? So if I do CRI kettle inspect Nginx, uh, I need to give it a container ID, so CRI kettle PS, CRI kettle inspect. You can see how this particular container is running. We can see the mounts that are associated with it, the host mounts and all that stuff. You can see the sandbox ID. So this is that pause container we were talking about. And the PID that's running that sandbox uh, pause container. See all the environments that are set inside of it, the mount paths in that infrastructure container, labels associated with it, with the actual container in general what the security contexts are, uh, things that are masked and read-only. But yeah, inspecting this container gives us, and we can see the capabilities that it's associated with, what's bounding and effective for it, what things are inheritable by this container, things that are permitted, the OOM score, all of that stuff is expressed in a way that we, that we can understand uh, just by looking at the inspection here. All right, that was pretty far into the weeds. I don't want to get too much more into it. Um, but yeah, that's a lot of information on the Kubelet and how it's configured. All right, I think I'm going to call this done for now. Uh, because I think we've given a pretty deep view in a systems view into the Kubelet. We understand how the Kubelet is authenticating with the API server. We understand how the API server is authenticating with the Kubelet. Let's go back to our checklist here. We've talked about where to find information about how it's configured and how many of these container in, uh, integrations are working, the container runtime, container networking, container storage, all of those things. We've talked about the Kubelet API, the configuration, how to view it and how to configure it, uh, what the metrics are that are exposed by the Kubelet. We talked about, quite a bit about theory of operation. We talked about static pods and plug. And I think that gives us pretty good coverage of the kubelet. Um, all right. Thank you very much. Um, tune in when next I'm on, and we'll configure, we'll continue our exploration in, uh, into the kube proxy layer and the kube controller manager and the scheduler and the API server. I'm going to see if I can bundle some of these things up, but there's a lot to cover here, and I'm, I'm realizing I, I really like fit off way more than I could chew to like try and do this at the kind of level that would that would be useful. So thank you all so so much. I'm definitely I'm definitely looking forward to more under the hoods as well. So y'all rock. Thanks for sticking around and I'll see you next time.